Good morning, brothers and sisters. I want to welcome you all to camp meeting this morning. What a privilege it is to gather together, and a special welcome is extended to those who are listening by phone and who are part of the virtual congregation. It is my prayer that we will all be blessed with God's Spirit as we study together. And before we get started, let's have prayer. Father, we're so thankful we can come together as a group to share with one another and to learn together with one another. And we ask that you will give us understanding of what I will be sharing later today and that you will bless us with your spirit. And whatever burden is on our hearts, we ask you to lift it now so that we can come in peace and enjoy before your throne. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. On February 9, 1942, the French transatlantic ocean liner SS Normandy was berthed in the New York City Harbor. She was the fastest the longest and the largest of all French liners, the pride of France. She had three funnels, although one was actually a dummy, and a masterpiece of an interior. The first class dining room was longer than the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, three decks high with magnificent Lalique designed lighting. It was walled with hammered glass had large bronze murals and 20 feet high entrance doors. A walk-through garden was on board with exotic birds and sprays of water. The main lounge had glass panels wrapping each corner designed by artist Jean Dupé, one of which is with the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York and each of the first-class cabins had a different decor and theme. The SS Normandy was impressive and a work of art, but it was wartime, and it was being refitted in the New York Harbor to be a Navy ship for Allied troops. But on February 9 at 2.30 p.m., the ship caught fire. A strong wind fanned the flames, and within hours the SS Normandy began to list to port and soon capsized. Efforts made to salvage her eventually became too costly and too complicated, and she was scrapped four years later. The burning of the SS Normandy started a chain of events that reaches down to us. Cries of sabotage were raised, and suspicions of fifth column activity were whispered. The New York Commissioner of Investigations imposed an immediate blackout on the waterfront and ordered a full investigation, which revealed prevalent gangster activity permeating the waterfront involving mobsters such as Sox Lanza, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, and the father of modern organized crime, Lucky Luciano, who was in prison at the time of the fire. <clears throat> Operation Underworld was formed, a clandestine group of high-level organized crime figures working with American intelligence for the benefit of both, OSS soon resulted, followed by the CIA. Luciano's sentence was commuted, and he was deported to Italy, followed by several other Italian crime figures and a nucleus of crime formed in Italy that reached to France. And the French connection, a pipeline for drugs, was born. The Italian mobsters also started drug activity in Mexico, and a pipeline into the United States was created. In China, the Green Gang rose to prominence. Opium became the currency of choice. Silver didn't matter. 
Paper was useless, but opium was in demand. Taxes were expected to be paid in opium, and the sale of opium supported the Nationalist Party of Chiang Kai-shek, who was warring against Mao Zedong and the Communist Party. Chiang Kai-shek did not deal in drugs, but the Green Gang did, and the Green Gang heavily supported Chiang Kai-shek financially. Chiang Kai-shek rose to power on the backs of addicts, which is interesting because Adventist Paul Quimbley claimed in his book that Chiang Kai-shek was a Christian. In the 20th century, crime became an affair that reached into the lives of the small people. Window installers, for example, were extorted one to two dollars per window, but how did the Adventist church fare during this worldwide growth of criminal power? The 20th century was a time of immense change for the Adventist church. The latter half of the earlier 19th century were years of growth and stability in faith and doctrine. But the 20th century were years of upheaval. Doctrines were changed or were dropped altogether. Books for the small people were written to promote these changes. Books for theologians were written, such as Desmond Ford's book on Daniel 8.14. Books to influence both groups were published, such as Questions on Doctrine in 1957. The 20th century also saw the faith of the righteous trampled upon in Russia so that true believers either were not seen because they had gone underground or because they were persecuted and many died. Adventist leadership in Russia advised its members to work on the Sabbath on collective farms during harvest and to engage in full military service, including the bearing of arms, both to appease the government. Intelligent and socially conscious Adventists in Germany supported and praised a despot responsible for the deaths of many millions. Over a thousand Adventists in Hungary were dis disfellowshipped because they opposed the church's move into ecumenical fellowship. Righteousness by faith in America was turned into unrighteousness by leadership decree, as seen in the General Conference's reaction to issues raised by Wheeland and Short. Sacred funds were invested in undesirable stocks and in financial schemes, and unequal pay for equal work was the accepted standard. Beauty was turned into ashes, joy into mourning, and praise into heaviness. The mighty fell, and the church resembled a daughter. But not all Adventists in Germany supported the Third Reich. In December 1941, Pastor Carl Harris held public lectures for the annual week of prayer. Unnoticed by him, three undercover Gestapo agents were, agents were sitting in the audience pretending interest. At the end of one lecture, they arrested him, and after intense interrogation, Harris admitted his opposition to the Nazi regime. In February 1942, the same month and year as the fire on the SS Normandy, he was convicted and transferred to the Sachsenhausen Oranienburg concentration camp. Though severely weak, he was ordered to clean sidewalks with a toothbrush. Many times he collapsed unconscious Soon he was transferred to the concentration camp at Gross Rosen in Lower Silesia, i.e. Poland, and forced to labor in a granite quarry.
This is the actual quarry he labored in. He managed to send a few letters home, and in one wrote that he refused to use the greeting Heil Hitler. Five months after his first internment, Karl Harris died. Adventists suffered particularly hard in the Soviet Union during persecutions ordered by Stalin. Entire congregations were wiped out. Seventy percent of all preachers and church leaders were killed, and three to four thousand church members lost their lives due to persecution, hunger, and detention in labor camps. But everybody learns and grows. Perhaps things are changing in the 21st century and ashes are turning back into beauty because here we are at the first U.S. camp meeting of a union of churches based on historic Adventists' beliefs. We are true Seventh-day Adventists. We would not gather our crops on the Sabbath nor send our children to school on God's sacred day. We hold dear the great truths given the Seventh-day Adventist Church during the first 50 years of its growth, including the perpetuity of the law of God and the ministry of our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary and his sanctifying work in our lives, preparing us for the end of the greatest of all controversies. Camp meeting is a time to draw closer to God, to learn more of His character, and to recommit our lives to Him. I don't remember who spoke at a camp meeting decades ago or any sermon preached. I don't remember the theme of the meetings. I don't even remember where it was held. I was an adult staying in a tent set up by the conference when a pastor came down my row stopping at each tent to visit. And so he arrived at my doorstep, a pleasant, older gentleman possessing an old, established faith, stopping to chat with a young person in possession of a young, untested faith. He could sense I wasn't going to share any concern or ask for prayer. We were strangers. So he told me, a story instead. He was piloting a small a aircraft and needed to land. The small airport was beneath him, that much he knew, but he could not see the landing strip, for dark, heavy clouds had surrounded him. He searched for a break in the clouds as he circled, but nothing. His fuel was low, and he knew if he didn't land soon, he faced certain death. So he prayed and asked God to open the clouds for him. And it happened. A circle of light opened in front of him. He could see the runway, and down he safely went. God answered my prayer and saved my life, and I've been thankful ever since, he said, as he waved and walked on, smiling a genuine smile of love for his Redeemer, a love that spilled over into my path. His faith became part of my faith, and now I too have an old, enduring faith. Colossians 2 is all about our Heavenly Father and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and it is addressed to us. For we are part of that group who has not seen the face of Paul. In the first 13 verses, Paul makes 14 points about Jesus and about our Heavenly Father. But this morning, we will only focus on verses 9 through 11. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete 
in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Colossians 2, 9 through 11. Let me reread this verse with a few words changed, allowed for by the Greek. For in him dwelleth all the completeness of the deity bodily. Likewise, ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and authority, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, stripping away or removing from the body the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Simply put, this is perfection of character and is what it means to be complete in Christ. But Adventists today who believe in perfection of character are rare and are even rarer in the larger field of Christianity. Methodists believe in perfection, although it is rarely preached by them, and so do Quakers. But that is about all. Let us review a few of the texts in Scripture that command us to be perfect. God's command to Abraham was to be perfect. I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Genesis 17.1 Moses instructed the Israelites to be perfect. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy 18.13 Solomon also instructed the Israelites to be perfect. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect with the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day, 1 Kings 8, 61. Noah and Job are referred to as being perfect King Asa's heart was perfect, and Abraham's belief in God was counted as righteousness. Jesus commands us to be perfect. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Matthew 5, 48. And he told the rich young ruler, Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Matthew nineteen twenty one. James counsels us to be perfect, wanting nothing. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing, James 1, 4. Paul and Epaphras also state we are to stand perfect. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, Colossians 4.12. But how perfect is perfect? And what does Jesus mean when he tells us to be perfect? I wish we could discuss each verse, but we haven't time. So we will focus on the one that is most familiar to us, Matthew 5.48. The Greek word translated perfect in this verse is teleos and is used 19 times in the New Testament, 17 of which are translated perfect. It has the meaning of perfection, completeness, and of lacking nothing. And we know this does not mean mature, as some teach, because teleos is also used in the same verse to describe God. Is God mature? 
Maturity has a sense of growth implied. I may be mature today, but in a year I hope to be more mature. And near the end of my life, I would hope to be most mature if illness does not intervene. But this cannot be said of God. Right now, yesterday, and tomorrow, He is the same. He is perfect, complete, lacking nothing, and that is the way we are to be, Jesus says. In one place in Scripture, teleos is translated full age. Age also implies a sense of growth. Is God a full age? No, He is ageless. Although He is called the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7, 9, 13, and 22, the word ancient implies a movement from youth to being ancient. But the Hebrew phrase ancient of days does not imply age or growth, but rather is a title of respect, honor, and veneration. In fact, the New Jerusalem Bible translates the phrase as one most venerable. But let's read of the phrase full age in Hebrews 5.14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, teleos, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, Hebrews 5.14. And add verses 10 and 11 for context. And the high priest after the order of Melchizedek that Paul refers to is Christ. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Hebrews 5, 10 through 11. The Hebrews of Paul's day were dull of hearing. The Greek word for, for dull is nothros, which means lazy, sluggish, slothful. Picture the movement of a sloth. This is the way the Hebrews' mind moved when considering Christ in his work, the most important topic in the world to us. They were not perfect or complete in their knowledge, and Paul wanted them to be. He chided them because they weren't. And we also must not be slothful in spiritual things. Many in the Adventist world do not want to hear about perfection because they are dull of hearing the hard words needed to be uttered. In the Greek, the phrase hard to be uttered means hard to explain, to interpret, to utter. So, because the idea of perfection is hard to explain, it is sometimes quickly tossed aside because it is thought to be synonymous with legalism. This can happen for a number of reasons. Perhaps those doing so do not know the love of God and of His Son, Jesus. Or they may not know the power God so generously gives us to overcome, and the peace that passeth understanding that follows. Or they have not experienced the greatest joy in heaven and in earth to be found in obeying God. The angels in heaven experience this joy, but in heaven, service is not rendered in the spirit of legality. When Satan rebelled against the law of Jehovah, the thought that there was a law came to the angels almost as an awakening to something unthought of. In their ministry, the angels are not as servants, but as sons. There is perfect unity between them and their Creator. Obedience to them is no drudgery. Love for God makes their service a joy. So in every soul wherein Christ, the hope of glory, dwells. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing 109.2 It is our greatest joy 
because God makes it so. All glory goes to him, and it becomes legalism when we try to accomplish it on our own, which never works, and which becomes a grinding, dreadful, unachievable task because we do not have the fellowship of him who has invited us to come unto him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. When we think of the suffering of Christ, we probably first think of the cross and the events surrounding his death, including the mental anguish caused by the withdrawal of the Father's presence, and rightly so. We may not be called upon to suffer in the same way, but we might. Jesus also suffered because of the reproach of others. Their taunts and insults, their mis representations, their rejection of his truth and mercy, and their lack of faith in him all caused him to suffer. And then he suffered because of self-denial. It is not easy to de deny self. It is not easy to put the good of others first and always. It is not easy to be like Isaac on the altar, trusting God to raise us up again or to be like John the Baptist in a lonely cell. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. God never leads his children Otherwise, then they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. Not Enoch, who was translated to heaven, not Elijah, who ascended in a chariot of fire, was greater or more honored than John the Baptist, who perished alone in the dungeon. Unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, Philippians 1.29, and all the, of all the gifts that heaven can bestow upon men. Fellowship with Christ in his sufferings is the most weighty trust and the highest honor, Desire of Ages 224.5. Many Christians instead choose a life centered on self, on ease and pleasure, and on finding fulfillment in the things of this world. God says through Isaiah, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts, Isaiah 65, 2. But this need not be. God has promised to make a way of escape when we want to go our own way and follow temptation and to give us strength for nothing is too hard for him. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Second Corinthians ten thirteen. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect, Psalm 18.32. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me, Philippians 4.13. Behold, 
I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah thirty-two twenty-seven. He has also promised to change us. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses. Ezekiel 36 26 through 27 and 29. We are told we are to regain the perfection man once had and thus stand complete in Christ. Here are a few of the many quotations that connect perfection with being complete in Christ. Every facility has been placed in reach by our Heavenly Father, that men may, through well-directed efforts, regain their perfection and stand complete in Christ. Ellen White, The True Higher Education, Union Conference Record, May 31, 1909. Are we striving with all our power to attain the statue of men and women in Christ? Are we seeking for His fullness ever pressing toward the mark set before us, the perfection of his character. When the Lord's people reach this mark, they will be sealed in their foreheads, filled with the Spirit. They will be complete in Christ. And the recording angel will declare, It is finished. Ellen White, Amazing Grace 216.5 All heaven is interested in the restoration of the moral image of God and man. All heaven is working to this end. God and the holy angels have an intense desire that human beings shall reach the standard of perfection which Christ died to make it possible for them to reach. It is his desire that we shall be one with Christ, complete in Christ, that we shall be heirs of heaven, but we are left free to choose. Heavenly Places 285. Elder C. H. Watson became the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists in 1930, but before this, when he was president of the Australasian Union Conference, he wrote, Every young Seventh-day Adventist should know that it is his or her sacred duty to make an unblemished character. It is not your first duty to be intellectual, but it is your first and fullest duty to possess a spotless character. That we should develop a character without blemish is a truth that is written indelibly In the gospel, a truth that is written large upon all that is true in life, a truth that is inscribed in all that is noble of human aspiration. And to deny it is to drift along with events until the star of our destiny falls from the heavens and goes out in the blackness of Sodom. C.H. Watson, The Value and Power of Character, Australasian Record, September 29, 1919. We read earlier that we are to regain our perfection and stand complete in Christ. This regained perfection involves the smallest of details. In order that the earthly tabernacle might represent the heavenly, it must be perfect in all its parts, and it must be in every smallest detail like the pattern in the heavens. So it is with the characters of those who are finally accepted in the sight of heaven. 
We know from the Bible that character perfection is the achievable goal of Christians, but it is not promoted within Adventism and in fact is usually proclaimed as impossible to achieve before glorification since sin is supposedly our nature and since we will continue to have this nature until Jesus returns. However, under inspiration, Ellen White explains that Christ's Righteousness is both imputed and imparted to us, and that we are to become like Christ in character now. Christ actually bore the punishment of the sins of the world that his righteousness might be imputed to sinners, and that through repentance and faith, they might become like him in holiness of character. Ellen White, North Pacific Union Cleaner, February 17, 1909, paragraph 3. Man must cooperate with divine power and put forth his human effort to subdue sin and to stand complete in Christ. Christ's work was to restore man to his original state, to heal him, through divine power. Man's part is to lay hold by faith of the merits of Christ and cooperate with the divine agencies in forming a righteous character. It was thus that God could save the sinner and yet be just and his righteous law be vindicated. Ibit paragraph 4. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character, and this character he offers to impart to us. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah, Ellen White, Christ. Object Lessons 311. A godly character is of more value than the possession of gold and earthly riches. It is of more value than a college education or any formal education. And it is, is of more value than a highly esteemed position or a powerful influence. Being truthful, upright, virtuous, honorable, and gifted with the presence of the Spirit of God is true worth and true power and is held by the faithful of God while the wisdom of the world, the traditions of men, the foolish deceptions of false Christianity and the principles of worldly practice are not. Chiang Kai-shek had a highly esteemed position and a powerful influence and this is what it seems he valued most. He had four wives, promising one in a Buddhist temple that he would not divorce her, but then sent her to the U.S. and divorced her while she was gone. He sought Soviet support for his government, worked out backroom deals with world leaders during World War II, and ordered at least one massacre and one assassination that I know of, and there are probably more, yet he claimed to be a Christian. He attended part of the Christmas Day program at the Government Institute for the Sons and Daughters of the Revolution near Nanking, a school run by Seventh-day Adventist 
Part way through the program, the curtains on stage closed, and Chiang Kai-shek walked up. In a calm and subdued voice, he began to tell the students the story of Jesus. Quimby recorded it this way. Beginning with his birth, he traced that holy life through his years of service. His ministry to the poor and the sick, then he described the events of Passion Week, his unjust trial, his crucifixion, his death, resurrection, and ascension. The beautiful language flowed like a shining river, bearing on its bosom the glorious news. No one who heard the Generalissimo that day could doubt his personal experience with Christ. Standing there in all the majesty of his position and the humility of, di of a disciple, he made his final appeal. Christ died for my sins and for your sins. He was nailed to the cross for my sins and for yours. He is my Savior and he is your Savior. I had risen from my place and had gone to the rear of the auditorium to stand beside one of the bodyguards. I felt the emotion of the whole vast audience during the final appeal. Then I looked up at the strong, hard man, a tough and determined soldier beside me. Tears flowed down his face. The Generalissimo's appeal had reached his heart. It had reached mine, and without doubt many others in that enormous crowd. Uh, quoted from Yankee on the Yangtze, pages 130 and 131. Was he a Christian? Only God knows, but certainly many of his actions contradicted his words. Maybe all he thought a Christian had to do was believe. And that perfection of character was not necessary or obtainable in this life. There are many who fail to understand the relation of faith and works. They say only believe in Christ and you are safe. You have nothing to do with keeping the law. But genuine faith will be manifest in obedience. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, 153. Seventh-day Adventism was formed by simple folk like you and me under the guidance of God. No theologians were involved. No high-ranking influential people joined the ranks. Early Adventists were just homegrown people who could read their Bibles and reason and who had a hungering and a thirsting for truth. So, it always amazes me to read the words of current, intelligent Adventist theologians obscuring issues that should be plain to all. For example, in the Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology, we read, even after conversion, sin besets Christians, making it possible for them to fall. In such cases, there is an advocate who can represent the sinner before God and through whom one can be forgiven. This is written by Anguel Manuel Rodriguez in this book on page 393. It is the first sentence upon which, which we wish to focus. Rodriguez is writing that sin persistently threatens Christians, making it possible for them to sin, or that transgressing the law threatens Christians, making it possible for them to transgress the law. You transgress the law, and that makes you transgress the law? This is doublespeak and makes no sense, and of course is not what Rodriguez means. He is saying instead 
that since sin is one's nature, it constantly threatens the Christian, making it possible for the Christian to sin. And we find ourselves in a theological maze about what sin is. But it doesn't have to be so. If we accept the only definition given in the Bible for sin, the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. In another article in the handbook, we are told, the predominant biblical view of the nature and essence of sin is that of personal estrangement from God. As such, it is relational at its core and rebellious in its expression. It is an act as well as a state. John Fowler uh, in the handbook, page 244. How did the Adventist denomination move from believing sin to be the transgression of the law to believing it to be a state of being? It all started with the theory called original sin. Ralph Larson, a pastor in the 1970s, said in a sermon, and I quote, the doctrine of original sin is an ancient error which has historically had no place at all in Seventh-day Adventist theology or in the writings of Ellen White. Stated briefly and simply, the doctrine of original sin includes these points. Number one, all men are guilty before God because of the sins of Adam, even if it were possible for them to live without performing a single sinful act in their entire lives. Two, they are judged and condemned by God for this guilt, which they inherit from Adam as fully as for their own sins. Three, this condition which is inherited from Adam is the fountain or source of all their temptations, lusts, and evil desires for. It is not possible for man to get rid of this condition while he lives upon this earth, even through the power of Christ. Five, it is therefore utterly impossible for men to ever achieve complete victory over sin while living upon this earth and it is dangerous for them to try. And six, since it would be impossible for Christ to be a savior if the inheritance of original sin passed to him from Mary, a variety of theological schemes have been introduced to prevent this from happening. Ralph Larson, who needs original sin, and then we have the um, link to his sermon. Larson goes on to say, the doctrine of original sin firmly rules out the possibility of a total victory over sin by any human being with or without the enabling power of Christ. The spirit of prophecy totally disagrees. Within its pages, the goal of character perfection through the power of Jesus Christ is constantly held before the reader. It never recommends a partial solution to the problem of sin. And this is where the concept that sin is our nature originates, and with it, the belief that we can never overcome sin in this life. It was a new, startling concept in Adventism in 1978 when Ralph Larson preached this sermon at the Campus Hill Adventist Church in Loma Linda, California. But in 2023, only 45 years later, it is thoroughly ingrained in Adventist thinking despite the fact that it has no biblical or spirit of prophecy support. You can read his explanation of the texts used by proponents of original sin in this sermon and in Appendix C in his book, The Word Was Made Flesh. 
in the 1,027 pages of the Handbook of Seventh-day Adventist Theology, you will not find doctrinal support for the perfection of character other than, possibly, that it should be our aim, unattainable though it is. Remember, the spirit of prophecy and the Bible never support a partial goal of perfection, a just-do-your-best approach. For this kind of thinking discredits God's ability to help all sinners become new creatures in Christ. In the handbook, you will find this, though, from Dr. Fowler about perfection. The fixation on perfection arose from early Adventist identification of themselves with the 144,000 of Revelation 14.1 and 7.4. A special group who are said to be spotless and blameless. This, in combination with the New Testament eschatological goal that at the end of time, God will have a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, Ephesians 5.27, led some Adventists to argue for perfection here on earth. And Fowler closed this section with a short quotation from page 678 of the great controversy about when the universe beats with one pulse of harmony because sin is no more. But he sadly doesn't tell us what is required for one who lives through the time of Jacob's trouble and becomes part of that vast, harmonious universe, perfection of character. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments, and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble, i.e. you and me, my words. It is in this life that we are to separate sin from us through faith in the atoning blood of Christ. Our precious Savior invites us to join ourselves to him, to unite our weakness to his strength, our ignorance to his wisdom, our unworthiness to his merits. God's providence is the school in which we are to learn the meekness and lowliness of Jesus. The Lord is ever setting before us, not the way we would choose which seems easier and pleasanter to us, but the true aims of life. It rests with us to cooperate with the agencies which heaven employs in the work of conforming our characters to the divine model. None can neglect or defer this work, but at the most fearful peril to their souls. Great Controversy 623. In 1909, Ellen White presented a sermon Sabbath morning at the San Jose, California Adventist Church, focusing on perfection and overcoming, and she shared the following thoughts. It is not enough that now and then you offer a prayer, and now and then you deal righteously. You are to have the attributes of an abiding Christ working out in your life constantly. How many of us have this experience? Yet we may have it, and having it, we will be the happiest people on the face of the earth. With Christ's word abiding in us, we shall give evidence that we have wholly received him who in his humanity lived a sinless life. In the strength of divinity, we shall overcome every tendency to evil. And that's uh, Letters and Manuscripts, um, Manuscript 97, 1909, page, paragraph 9. It is only the overcoming Christian 
who will reach the kingdom of heaven. May God help us in this matter is my prayer. Paragraph 11. Christ took humanity and bore the hatred of the world that he might show men and women that they could live without sin, that their words, their actions, their spirit might be sanctified to God. We can be perfect Christians if we will manifest this power in our lives. Paragraph 18. There are some among us who refuse to purify their souls by obedience to the truth, and they bring forward their sophistries to show that those who adhere strictly to a thus saith the Lord are altogether too particular. They seek to divert the mind from purity and truth and holiness and the development of, a, of Christian character, but such souls stand on Satan's side of the question. Paragraph 19. Shall those who refuse to be converted reject the right of entrance through the gates into the city, charge God with severity and harshness? Paragraph 20. In the life of Christ, a perfect pattern has been given to every child of humanity. From infancy to manhood, the life of Christ was perfect, teaching us that in everything we should seek perfection. To his work at his father's bench, he brought the same principle. Some would laugh at him for the pains he would take, but he would not be turned from his purpose to bring out of that which was imperfect something that would stand the test of proving. Paragraph 22. Yiri Mascala, the dean of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary in Berrien Springs, has written in the book, God's Character in the Last Generation, when our names are called during the pre-Advent judgment, Jesus, as the true witness of our lives, presents our principal choices, deep convictions, and life orientation before the universe's representatives, Daniel 7, 9, 10, 13, and 14. First of all, my words now, first of all, Evidence is presented to the Ancient of Days by Jesus Christ, sometimes contested by Satan, and the Ancient of Days makes the decision. Holy beings of the universe are present to witness the proceedings, as far as we know, but not as the jury, as could be inferred from his statement. As far as stating that Jesus presents for each case principal choices, deep convictions, and life orientation, the Bible simply states, we are judged by our works. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and, the, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. Revelation 20, 12 through 13. See also Ecclesiastes 12, 14 and 2 Corinthians 5, 10. And the works reviewed are not just the principal ones. Could the veil which separates the visible from the invisible world be swept back and the children of men behold an angel recording every word and deed to meet them again in the judgment? How many words that are daily uttered would remain unspoken? How many deeds would remain undone? The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 312.1. Muscala continues, If we are found hidden in Christ, then our destiny is sealed with the seal of the living God, and we will be protected from the seven last plagues and be ready for the second coming of Christ. 
Paul tells us, my words now, Paul tells us in Galatians 2.20 that Christ lived in him and in Philippians 2.7 that we are to have the mind of Christ. Whether this is what Muscala means by hiding in Christ, we are not told. And we will discuss this in more detail soon. But as far as the sealing of our destiny is concerned, in the investigative judgment, it is our record that determines our sealing, a record that reveals repentance and forgiveness or the lack thereof. But in addition, a special work of purification is to be accomplished among God's people during this time of investigation. It is only when this special work of purification is completed that the followers of Christ will be ready for the second coming. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. When this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for His appearing. Then the church, which our Lord at His coming is to receive, will be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Ephesians 5.27, quoting Great Controversy 4.25. The dean of the seminary never mentions this special work of purification, nor sins being removed from the heavenly sanctuary. Why? Again, he doesn't say, but understanding the correct definition of sin is crucial to comprehending the special work of purification and the investigative judgment. If one understands sin to be one's nature and not the transgression of the law as the Bible states in 1 John 3, 4, then no special work of purification can be done before the return of Jesus. The time period after Jesus leaves the sanctuary and before his return, is known as the time of Jacob's trouble. And Ellen White compares this time to the wrestling, to the experience of Jacob wrestling with the angel. It will be a time of intercession, pleading, and petitioning by God's people, and a time of affliction of soul. God's people, that's in brackets, afflict their souls before God. They do not cease their intercessions. Like Jacob, all are wrestling with God. Their countenances express their internal struggle. Paleness sits upon every face. Yet they cease not their earnest intercession. The wrestling ones urge their petitions before God, pleading, for divine protection. And those are various quotes taken from uh, volume 4 of the Spirit of Prophecy starting on 437. Do you remember the story of the pilot and the parting of the clouds? God's people at this time experience their own parting of the clouds. Through a rift in the clouds, There beams a star whose brilliancy is increased fourfold in contrast with the darkness. It speaks hope and joy to the faithful, but severity and wrath to the transgressors of God's law. Those who have sacrificed all for Christ are now secure. He 
hidden as in the secret of the Lord's pavilion. Volume 4, The Spirit of Prophecy, 456. And this is the meaning of being hidden in Christ. Yes, God's people are sealed at the close of probation, but there yet remains a work that must be done in their lives, the removal of earthliness. Their affliction is great. The flames of the furnace seem about to consume them, but the refiner will bring them forth as gold tried in the fire. God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity, but it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace fire. Their earthliness must be removed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. Again, uh, volume 4, The Spirit of Prophecy, 438. When this is done, they are secure and hidden in the secret of the Lord's pavilion. It's a shame Muscala never explains this hiding in Christ. It is not when they are sealed, as he states, but it is after their sealing and after their wrestling, interceding, and pleading with God that they are hidden in the secret pavilion of the Lord's pavilion. Jean Zerker taught the, at the French Adventist Seminary in Cologne, France, during World War II, and Dr. Zerker became a recognized Adventist theologian, was on the board of the Ellen G. White Estate, wrote for the Biblical Research Institute, was a delegate to the 1980 General Conference session in Dallas, Texas, at which time he was nominated and approved to be the secretary of the Euro-Africa Division, and at which time he is not on record as challenging any of the changes that took place in the fundamental principles, and has author, he has authored a book on perfection in which he wrote concerning Ellen White. She presents Christian perfection as an essentially relative concept. And then he develops a premise that God is a perfect harmonious whole, quoting Christ's object lessons, but that humans do not have this ability. Jean Zerker wrote, A careful reading leaves no doubt concerning the relative nature of perfection in Ellen White's mind. All righteous attributes of character dwell in God as a perfect harmonious whole, COL 330. But, as we shall see, human beings do not have all of them, nor have them in the same way. Zerker, What Inspiration Has to Say About Christian Perfection, page 79. Let us read the quotation he uses from Christ Object Lessons in context. Here we go. Moral perfection is required of all. Never should we lower the standard of righteousness in order to accommodate inherited or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. We need to understand that imperfection of character is sin. All righteous attributes of character dwell in God as a perfect, harmonious whole, comma, and everyone who receives Christ as a personal Savior is privileged to possess these attributes. Christ Object Lessons 330.2 When you compare his account with the original quotation, you find that he uses a phrase, and that's why I put comma when I read the quotation. He uses a phrase from Christ's Object Lessons, but leaves out the beginning of the statement, which reads, Moral perfection is required of all. Never should we lower the standard of righteousness in order to accommodate inherited or cultivated tendencies to wrongdoing. We need to understand that imperfection of character is sin. 
He also leaves out the concluding remarks, which state, And everyone who receives Christ as a personal Savior is privileged to possess these attributes. Ellen White continues in this section. But Christ has given us no assurance that to attain perfection of character is an easy matter. A noble, all-around character is not inherited. It does not come to us by accident. A noble character is earned by individual effort through the merits and grace of Christ. God gives the talents, the powers of the mind. We form the character. It is formed by hard, stern battles with self. Conflict after conflict must be waged against hereditary tendencies. We shall have to criticize ourselves closely and allow not one unfavorable trait to remain uncorrected. That's um, COL 331. But she goes on to say, Let no one say I cannot remedy my defects of character. If you come to this decision, you will certainly fail of obtaining everlasting life. The impossibility lies in your own will. If you will not, then you cannot overcome. The real difficulty arises from the corruption of an unsanctified heart and an unwillingness to submit to the control of God. Again, Christ Optic Lessons 331.2. The heavenly intelligences will work with the human agent who seeks with determined faith that perfection of character which will reach out to perfection in action. To everyone engaged in this work, Christ says, I am at your right hand to help you. That's paragraph four. The context is painfully plain. Let's look at another quotation from Ellen White that Zerker uses to try to discount the achievement of perfection of character. Under the heading entitled, A Completely Relative Perfection, he states Ellen White presents Christian perfection as an essentially relative concept, which we referred to earlier. But he also quotes from volume two of the Testimonies, which states, we cannot equal the pattern, but we shall not be approved of God if we do not copy it and, according to the ability which God has given, resemble it. And then Zerker states, in fact, God asks us to do only that which we are able. Again, let us read her quotation in context. In a letter written to Brother A, whom she described as a selfish and grasping minister, Ellen White wrote, Ministers especially should know the character and works of Christ, that they may imitate him. For the character and works of a true Christian are like his. He laid aside his glory, his dominion, his riches, and sought after those who were perishing in sin. He humbled himself to our necessities that he might exalt us to heaven. Sacrifice, self-denial, and disinterested benevolence characterized his life. He is our pattern. Have you, Brother A, imitated the pattern? I answer no. He is a perfect and holy example given for us to imitate. We cannot equal the pattern, but we shall not be approved of, of God if we do not copy it, and according to the ability which God has given, resemble it. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 459.1 we cannot equal the pattern, for the pattern is Christ, and we will never be equal to Christ, but we can imitate the pattern, we can copy it, we can resemble it. Christ is our pattern, the perfect and holy example that has been given 
us to follow. We can never equal the pattern, but we may imitate it and resemble it according to our ability. Review and Herald, February 5, 1895, paragraph 7. And the ability she is referring to is the ability every human heart has. It is not arbitrarily or unequally given. We are to be perfect in our sphere as Christ is perfect in his sphere. Let us not be unconcerned regarding our responsibility to form righteous characters, but let us place ourselves under the molding influence of the Holy Spirit that we may form characters that will reflect the divine life. That's letter 62, 1911, paragraph 12. When Zerker says, God asks each of us to do only that which we are able in gaining character and perfection, i.e. in overcoming. He implies that some are more able than others, and we are just to do our best. But God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't give some more ability to overcome than others. We are all tempted differently. It is true. One may be strongly tempted with alcohol and another not at all, or another with theft, etc. But the point is, whatever the temptation and whatever the strength of that temptation, God will give to each the power needed to overcome, if it is sought by faith. Otherwise, how unfair would God be? And this is exactly what Satan wants us to believe, that God is unfair, that he helps some more than others. We are victorious by faith in God and in his promises, and then God works his miracles in the unseen world to force Satan back. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 4. And God will hear our cry for help in the time of temptation. Call unto me and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Jeremiah 33, 3. And he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Psalm 91, 15. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Isaiah 65, 24. Perfection of character is being mystified and reworked, just as the concept of God, the work of Jesus in the most holy place, the investigative judgment, and the fundamental beliefs at the 1980 General Conference session have been. Why do you think there is a resistance to the perfection of character? It is because some people do not view sin as repulsive as Jesus does, and thus they do not fight it with determination. Instead, sin becomes watered down and is easily lived with, and God is considered too particular, harsh, and severe to require otherwise. In 1873, Roswell F. Cottrell wrote concerning a recent camp meeting in California. The recent report of the camp meeting in California was cheering indeed. Such order and unity and such evidences of the presence of God and holy angels binding every wild spirit and evil influence and filling believers with solemn joy seem very much like the beginning of the end. And we may enjoy the like in other places, 
God is ready to pour his spirit upon all who are ready to receive it. His hand is not shortened. He is not a respecter of persons, nor is he confined to places. He that does the will of God is accepted and where true worshipers are, his spirit is. And a Pentecostal season may be enjoyed if we prepare our hearts to receive the Comforter, if we open the door, we shall receive the great blessing. But though this is our privilege, our trials are not ended. We shall meet with those all the way till our work is done, but God will sustain all who trust in Him and are faithful in duty. The faithful in all places will ere long see greater things than these. The living God will vindicate his truth and will save those who truly trust in him. Let me have a part with the humble few that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. R.F. Cottrell, The Beginning of the End, The Advent Review and Herald of the Sabbath, December 16, 1873. Rather than the influential, the powerful, the beautiful, the intelligent, and the rich which the world offers, the humble few who love God in His ways and who wish to vindicate Him before the teeming millions who mock Him are the ones who are of true value and worth. We may each have had a youthful, untried faith, but now possess an established, settled one, a durable fire, so to speak, a fire that will last through rain, bleakness, and fear. Yet we can still stumble if that fire should chill. But God knows how to fan the flames, how to bank it for the long nights, and he always hears our cry when lost in the cold. His helping hand reaches down. His encouraging words warm the shivering spirit. And he stays the feet on the narrow path Ellen White saw in an impressive dream. It is a path we all are on, a path that many have left for the pleasure, entertainment, and desires of the world below. Brothers and sisters, we will have to symbolically take off our shoes and socks to stay on this path. We will have to free ourselves of every weight, and we will have to endure hardship and privation, but we are almost home. Thank you.